welcome Brian Shalloway. So I'm a data scientist here in RQP at NetApp, and today I'll be talking about how to manage uh, the various kinds of kinds of objects you get created during analytics workflows using data frames. So this talk is pulled from about five hours of talks from some of my idols at RStudio, as well as several book chapters, and I'm just trying to condense it into a very quick seven-minute presentation. So this chart behind me shows some of the common processes that occur during any analytics project. The example that I'll be talking about today comes from prisoner data from Australia. So our starting question is, across the states in Australia, what is the relationship between the number of prisoners sentenced versus those remanded? So today I'm talking about data frames, as I said. So when you first get this problem, the first thing you need to do is get data from all of your different sources, reshape it, maybe create extra columns or features. But the whole time when you're interacting with data frames is typically in these inertial phases. So once you've done all of that, you may get some perfect data frame that now you can actually do something useful with. After you've made your data frame, you actually don't care about your data frame as much as these other things that you can do with it. You may pass it into ggplot or matplotlib and build some visualizations. You may pass it into care or scikit-learn and build some model objects. From those, you may build out uh, plot evaluation metrics. And what kind of starts to happen here is that your environment starts to fill up with all of these different objects, and it can start to get a little bit cluttered. Let's say you add on the requirement that you need to build separate objects for each individual state. In this data set, we have eight different Australian states. That means eight different um, model objects, eight different evaluation uh, sets, all these different charts. And this kind of like cluttering problem can become a bigger problem and tougher to keep track of. The traditional ways that you deal with this problem, especially under you know, lots of iteration, is that you either build for loops or you use split, apply, combine type workflows to manage this. What I'll be talking about is very similar to these, but what it does is it says you can use data frames to help manage this process. So rather than thinking of data frames as just a table of information that you interact with during these, these first initial steps, I want you to expand your notion of a data frame to think about the actual data frame structure and how it can be helpful in organizing these other processes. So what I'm about to show is going to be what one of these data frames looks like. It's going to look a little bit weird. At first, I'll be walking through how I built this thing out. So this new data frame that I made, each row in it represents an individual state within Australia. The only column in this data frame that actually is, probably seems familiar and normal is that state Australia column. It's just a character vector. Each of the other columns represent lists. So when I, you see this column data, each element within that column, each row, represents the, a data frame for, that contains all the data for that particular state. The models column represents a list containing all of the individual models for each of those data frames. So this, this element right here, that corresponds with the actual model built from that data frame. The evaluation metrics column represents a list of all the evaluation metrics built off of each of those individual models. So the first question is, is, why does this work? This is kind of a weird structure. Why is this like a valid thing to actually do? Um, so if you think about what a data frame is, don't think of it as just like a table. A data frame is a list of vectors with the requirement that each of those vectors must be equal length. Now, a list is just a special type of vector that allows each element to be of any type or dimension. So therefore, a list is a completely valid column to use within a data frame. Now, at first this looks a little weird, but if you just kind of like open your mind up, it starts to make sense in certain ways. It starts to be really valuable in certain situations. That's what I'm gonna talk about next, is how this can be valuable. So why would you want to make this weird structure? Why would you want to do this? So I'll be talking about two main reasons. One is it encourages good functional programming, and second, that it helps you to keep things organized. So when I say it encourages good functional programming, I'm going to show how I built out that weird looking data frame. So we started with our prisoner's data. Here's what that data frame looked like. To build that first nested column of data frames, I'm just saying let's group by the state of Australia, and then let's nest that, in, and this is just going to make that column where all of our data um, for each state sits within this list. So you have a data frame then for each list. Next, I wanted said that I wanted to um, build models off of this data frame. So what I'm going to do is just say, okay, I want to take that data and I want to apply a linear models function that will be mapped across each of those individual data frames. That's how I created these, this list of models. Next, to create the evaluation metrics off of those models, I just said, let's use this glance function. Glance is just a function that 
extracts the evaluation metrics from a model. Let's just map that glance function across each of those individual models to get at our evaluation metrics. So once you get used to this kind of structure, it makes it really easy to follow what you're doing. And you can kind of like plug different pieces into these pipelines, and it becomes easy to debug, easy to build out. Um, and there's just a lot of like elegance that goes into the way that you end up building your scripts. Um, second thing I said is that it keeps things organized. Beforehand, we had our plots in one location, our model objects in another, our evaluation metrics in another place. Everything was kind of all over, uh, all over your environment. Now we have this natural row structure where each row corresponds with some state, and you have your data that is connected via this row structure that connects with your model, it connects with the evaluation metrics. Everything is nicely organized. Also, each column makes sense. Each column just represents a natural progression, like an important step within your analytics workflow. This structure is also easy to um, pull things out of. So let's say I want to see, OK, how does the um, R squared, or how does the model perform across states? I can just say, let's unnest my evaluation metrics, and then that'll create this new data frame that they can pass into some visualization to see, OK, how does R squared look across each of the different states that I built out for each of those different states? Um, so that's just a couple reasons why you might want to do this. Um, then you can pass this into some, but there's a lot of other use cases that I did not get into. Um, so I encourage you to go and check out using these, uh, these structures. And I think once you do, you'll see a lot of problems that at first seem really tricky. All the limitations just kind of like wash away. So, um, and you're just flying. So I encourage you to check out these other resources. Um, these are where I pulled all these materials from. If you're interested in this, feel free to take a picture of this slide and go check some of those out, or I'll be emailing this out later. Thank you.